So back to spanning tree. Uh, so the root bridge, even after the system has stabilized and you know the message traffic has, has been uh, blocked for all of the nodes, the bridges rather that are not uh, being active, um, the root bridge will still send out periodic uh, configuration messages and they will still get repeated by the bridges. Uh, and all the bridges listen for these. And if they don't hear one of these within a, pre a prescribed timeout, then they will assume that one or more of the links along that path uh, have failed and they'll start the process again. So they'll assume, okay, I'm a root node. Uh, and again, the negotiation will go through and correct that. So this means that even if a particular bridge fails, uh, that the spanning tree will self heal uh, and communications will continue to, uh, to work. Um, but what this doesn't do, so it, it's for failure uh, of bridges, congestion is not uh, bypassed by this. Multiple links are not simultaneously used either. Um, it's purely about uh, ensuring that there is a path between uh, every node, uh, every network segment uh, on the network without this problem of, uh, of loops. So again, if we look at um, how spanning tree works uh, in, uh, in practice, uh, that uh, we can, we, by default, you will still forward all broadcast and multicast frames um, through the tree again uh, with the, the pruned tree. Um, ideally, we'd want to learn when there are no group members in a multicast group and stop sending it uh, so that we don't congest the networks uh, down. And we do this by having uh, at least one group member uh, of each multicast group sending a frame to the bridge, um, basically indicating, you know, this is a, a multicast group to which I have interest. So this tells the uh, the bridges that there is a subscriber to the multicast group that then gets percolated back through uh, so that uh, the multicast will get delivered onto those network segments where it's required, but not anywhere else. So um, there are limitations with this approach though. Uh, the spanning tree algorithm doesn't scale. If the network gets particularly large, uh, the time to stabilization is going to be quite high and the expected uh, you know, rate of failure and movement of nodes in and out of range uh, is going to, um, uh, to mean that it may never stabilize. Um, the other thing, it, it doesn't really deal with heterogeneous networks. So what we mean there is that if different links have different speeds um, or available uh, capacity, uh, spanning tree is blind to this. Uh, so if, for example, you had a 10 megabit and a gigabit Ethernet link uh, as options, the 10 megabit link might get chosen in preference to the gigabit link because it has one fewer uh, hops in it, for example, um, even though it will have only one one hundredth the capacity. So um, moving on, though, to, uh, to VLANs, virtual LANs. Um, this is a mechanism that you can use to... Uh, further segregate traffic and make it uh, a little bit more convenient uh, for managing networks. So we might have uh, two bridges linking together um, two, if you like, halves of LAN. So VLAN 100, so this is a, a LAN that has W on it and we have VLAN 100 that has X on it. Logically, we want this to behave as if W and X are on the same LAN. Likewise, Y and Z are on VLAN 200. We want those to behave as if they are logically on the same LAN. So this is what uh, VLANs are uh, oops, uh, designed to achieve. So if uh, the bridges tag all traffic that's come from VLAN 100 uh, with the VLAN 100 tag on it, when it sends it to bridge two, bridge two goes, oh, okay, I don't care who the sender or the receiver is, it's for VLAN 100, I will forward it out onto this LAN. And likewise, anything coming back from there will get the same uh, label come across through here. This one will look at that uh, and say, yep, okay, the VLAN 100, it needs to come up and get distributed onto this network. And so W would receive it. Likewise for VLAN 200 uh, down here. Um, one use sometimes actually for VLANs as well is to have a management VLAN, which connects the configuration interface that's internal to various switches on a network together so that they are logically accessible on a single uh, network segment. Uh, so that can make management a little bit easier to do. Okay, let's have a look at internetworking then. So an internetworking, unlike 
uh, the, the bridge derangement that effectively requires the networks to be uh, homogeneous, so not heterogeneous, the opposite, um, i.e. sharing uh, similar properties. With internetworking, we want to be able to connect different types of networks, which may have different uh, network speeds, and uh, some may be wired, some may be wireless. Uh, they may have a, a wide variety of properties. So being able to have this kind of you know, way to, to glue all of these kinds of networks together uh, to actually make uh, a coherent network where all of the hosts can communicate. So we look at the, uh, the example that's on the, um, uh, the slides here. Uh, we've got some hosts here on an Ethernet network. We've got another Ethernet network up here. Um, we might have routers that are connecting those together. There might be a router that connects that to a wireless access point, and we can have some more hosts uh, on there. Uh, and so we want, for example, host five to be able to communicate with host nine just as easily as host one could communicate with host two. So internetworking is what allows us to do this by having routers that can uh, determine the best way to get uh, to a node which is not on the local network. So in a sense, it's behaving like a bridge where one side is a, a known LAN and the other side is the rest of the world, the rest of the internet. So the way we do this uh, is with the internet protocol. And again, this is using the layered uh, network approach to achieve this. So the uh, IP network lives at layer three and above that we have TCP and UDP and the like, uh, the higher layers. Uh, but IP has to run on all of the nodes that are in the path to connect. So again, if we look at host five and host eight wanting to communicate in this example, so from here through to here, uh, we have a link here over wireless. Uh, then it goes through the router, which is directly connected, uh, presumably via Ethernet, to that. Direct Ethernet connection into network 2. Direct Ethernet connection into router 2. Direct Ethernet connection to router 3. Direct Ethernet connection onto the Ethernet that actually has host 8. Um, but, uh, so, so this one here, sorry, is not an Ethernet. This is point to point. This might be a dial-up link, for example. So if we have a look at how the network is working, um, host 5 wants to send a, a TCP packet. It goes down, gets encapsulated in an IP uh, packet. That goes down as Wi-Fi, right? So it's 802.11. Um, so the packet gets encapsulated in an 802.11 Wi-Fi uh, frame. That then goes across Wi-Fi. It comes into the first router. Now, the, first, the routers don't have to have TCP or any higher layer because the handling of the packets will only be at the IP layer at the highest. So it will come in as an 802.11 frame, uh, will get uh, decapsulated back to being an IP frame, an IP packet, sorry. Um, and then the router goes, okay, I have an IP packet addressed to such and such an address. What route uh, do I have for that? Which link should it go on? Oh, it should go out this ethernet link. So it will get uh, re-encapsulated uh, in an ethernet frame. Um, and then that will go via ethernet and come into router two. Um, router two, the same thing will happen. The ethernet, uh, uh, frame will get removed from the outside, leaving us with an IP packet. The router will make a decision. Okay, how do I get to this, uh, to H8? Now, whatever its IP address is that's in there. Oh, I have to send it via this PPP link. No worries, it will go down to the, uh, through the PPP interface, get the PPP header uh, put on it, sent via PPP, come into router three, again, decapsulated up to being an IP packet only, which will then go, ah, okay, I need to send this via ethernet, uh, via this interface. So it gets the ethernet frame uh, encapsulated around that, goes via Ethernet and gets into host 8, which goes, oh, there's an Ethernet frame addressed to me. Um, I should take the Ethernet frame off that and look at the contents. Oh, it's an IP uh, packet. Oh, I should take the IP header off because it's addressed to me and pass it up to TCP, the next layer up, um, which will then, uh, you know, looking at, okay, yep, the port matches the connection I have and pass it onto the application. So here we've had three different media types, 802.11 wireless, Ethernet, and a PPP uh, dial-up link. So very different networks with very different properties, and yet the hosts at either end can communicate as if they were just on the same network. This is the magic of internet working. This is what makes the internet work at the end of the day. So IP, um, the manner in which it works. So it's a connectionless model, so it's datagram-based. I mean, it's unreliable. It's the best effort delivery. And if you think about um, uh, connecting these differing networks together would be really hard to reserve 
uh, you know, a virtual circuit across those in any kind of sensible manner. Not necessarily impossible, it would be quite hard to do. Uh, and because you don't control all of the, uh, the network devices on the internet, in fact, if some links don't want to do virtual circuits, then you would never be able to. So um, IP simply says the simple model that we're using is a datagram based uh, approach. Uh, and every IP enabled host must support IP datagrams. Um, so connectionless, best effort. Uh, packets might get lost uh, because of all sorts of reasons. It might be uh, you know, errors during transmission. It might be a lack of uh, buffering, uh, all sorts of things. Um, uh, packets might get delivered out of order. They might take different routes to get places. It might be you know, handled in buffers that uh, you know, aren't strictly in order for some reason, uh, particularly again, if you have retransmissions. Um, you might get more than one copy of a packet, either because uh, an ACK was lost and so a retransmission occurs, or some, you know, in some places in the network, it might go, oh, well, I'll try sending it down two different routes at the same time and see which one gets there first, because that will give the end user uh, you know, a, a better result. And we can't predict what the latency, the delivery time will be for each packet, because we don't know how it's going through the network. We don't know, you know, is it going over a fiber optic cable under the ocean or is it going via a geostationary satellite link? That part of me will be much slower. We just don't know. Um, so it's best effort delivery. Uh, no, there's no guarantees of anything. Um, then one of the other key pieces of IP is that it gives you a global addressing scheme. So this means that you have a unique identifier for every host on the network. So the IP address needs to be uh, globally unique. Now there's a wrinkle in this, which is network address translation, which we'll talk about uh, later in the semester uh, and later in this textbook. So let's have a look at IPv4 uh, headers. So this is the kind of the, the original version of the internet that's been used. Um, IPv6 is out there as well now. Uh, and is progressively uh, you know, being used more and more. But that transition to IPv6 has proven to be exceptionally slow. IPv6 was announced in 1995. Uh, and again, this thing, uh, network address translation, really actually slowed down the adoptive adoption of IPv6 because the main limitation of IPv4, which is only less than uh, two to the power of 32, less than four billion um, oops, sorry, uh, IP addresses, has actually been relieved. Uh, destination source address, 32 bits each, yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. So there's a version field. Um, so this has four in it for IPv4, it has six in it for IPv6. And then the header length is a four bit number, which says how many 32 byte words are in the header. So the IP header cannot be more than 16 uh, times four is 64 bytes long. Uh, then we have the length of the datagram um, uh, next, 16 bits, we can have up to 64 kilobytes. Um, ident is used for fragmentation and reassembly. So if a, frame, a packet rather is too big uh, to go over some links, uh, then uh, we have reassembly information. So IP um, natively supports packet fragmentation and reassembly. Uh, we then have uh, a bunch of flags again, and the offset, this is again used for the, um, uh, the fragmentation. TTL, time to live, so the number of hops at this Datagram has traversed. Uh, so uh, the TTL will tick down progressively as a, it goes over more and more hops. And so this can be used to prevent routing loops. Uh, if you see packets coming through with wildly different TTLs and the same destination, then you've probably got a routing loop. Um, protocol um, is which protocol within the IP packet is being used. So for example, TCP is number six, um, UDP is number 17. And so these are both eight bit fields. Then we have a 16-bit checksum. We spoke about checksums earlier uh, in the textbook as well. Then the source address and the destination address. Um, notice that IP wasn't seemingly designed by hardware uh, engineers. Um, the hardware engineers, like for Ethernet, would have put the destination address as early as possible uh, in there. So you need to have the version number, um, but you could actually have the destination address could have started uh, immediately after the version number, uh, or maybe on the next boundary would have been uh, most sensible. Uh, but instead, it's how it is, and that's fine. Modern systems can handle this uh, fairly well. The only real implication is that the, the necessary delay in routing an IP packet is related to how long it takes to receive those first few bytes until you get to the destination address. 
Uh, and then you can have options uh, in the IP header uh, and padding to pad it out to a complete number of 32-bit uh, words. And then the data is uh, what follows. So the checksum comes before the data um, as well. So again, this, this ordering and having the checksum early and the destination address late does make it a little bit of a, uh, a pain to process IPP, uh, to route and process IP, uh, IP packets in hardware. But again, modern hardware can do this uh, fine. Right, so uh, as we said, IP uh, supports fragmentation and reassembly. So every network has some maximum length uh, that can be transferred in a given frame uh, or packet. So on Ethernet, traditionally this was 1500 bytes. Uh, for some other uh, media, it can be larger or smaller. So FDDI can be four and a half kilobytes, more or less. ATM, we've already heard, was only 53 bytes, which is clearly a problem. Um, so if a datagram is bigger than the MTU, the maximum transmission unit, so if you had a two kilobyte IP packet, we would need to fragment it to fit on uh, an Ethernet network. So the router that has received the big packet that wants to put it onto the media that supports only a smaller MTU, at that point has to do the fragmentation. And it then stays fragmented all the way through to the receiving host. And so all the fragments carry the same identifier field value um, and they'll have different offset values uh, in there. And um, each fragment then is wrapped as its own IP packet, just a smaller one now. Um, IP doesn't try and recover from lost fragments. So either they all get through or they don't. Um, so it's not a, a complete solution. Uh, a lot of protocols on IP will actually do MTU discovery as part of the protocol to avoid fragmentation from happening. Uh, and in fact, a lot of IP networks will refuse to fragment uh, as well. So uh, let's have a look at a, an example of this. H5 and H8 want to communicate. Let's imagine that the PPP link only supports 512 byte packets. So when it comes in via 802.11, uh, and the, this packet happens to be 1400 bytes long, that's fine because the ethernet link, the next one, is 14, uh, can handle 1500 bytes, which is bigger, no problem. Uh, when it comes through to the, um, uh, the next router that has to go onto the PPP link, at that point it goes, oh, bother, uh, this is too big. It has to fragment it into three smaller pieces, each of which are no bigger than 512 bytes. Um, and then that will get transferred. The next router that can go via ethernet, even though in theory, if the router wanted to do the reassembly, um, because now the next link is, uh, is large enough, has a large enough MTU uh, that it could be handled, it doesn't. It just passes them through and H8, the receiving host, receives those three fragments and must do the reassembly itself. Now, having said that, the routers could do the reassembly, but generally speaking, in practice, that doesn't happen. Uh, and so again, if we look at that uh, in detail, so we start with the unfragmented packet, which has 1400 bytes of data, and it has the header, uh, all the, the header fields there, and there is a zero to indicate that it's fragmented, and zero for the offset for the fragment. Once it's fragmented, we now get three pieces, uh, the f and each one has a full IP header. But in that, we have some fields are set uh, for, the, um, uh, for the, uh, the, each fragment. So all of them say that there are more fragments that follow uh, for this packet, except the last one, which has a zero in that field, uh, to say that this is the last fragment of that packet. And they all have the same identifier field that was supplied by the sender in the packet originally. Um, but now, we have the, um, uh, the offset, which is measured in uh, words, again, from memory. Uh, so uh, it's uh, going to count that. And uh, then that will be set to 64 in this first one. And the next one will be 128. And so the first two have 512 bytes of data. The third one has less data uh, because the total adds up to only 1400. So that's our three fragments. So that's fine. So long as it's less than the 512-byte uh, MTU uh, limit, then it's fine and it will fit. Okay, and we'll come back to this in the next video.